Here we go again, another Sunday podcast episode. I'm Ray, as you know by now. What have we got? It's dark out there. Ah, Saturday morning, it's dark and it's 7 o'clock. 12 degrees, which is 53 Fahrenheit. Lashing rain all night. I think it's eased off for a minute. 82% humidity, should be 100. And 991 millibars. The flag I can just about see in the dark. A huge wind. Can you have a huge wind from the West? Now, what's this episode all about? Genetic memory. That's interesting. Look into that in a minute. Old TV ads, old TV programmes, old cars. Do you remember pulling out the choke on your car in the morning before you start the engine? Do you remember having to check the antifreeze in the winter? (laughs) I'll talk about that later. I hope you're all well. And look it after yourselves. Rob in Australia has had an idea about unusual British laws, ancient laws, perhaps from the 1600s, way back when, that are still in existence today. They are still in force. I'm going to be talking about that next weekend. So that's something to look forward to, isn't it? Say yes, it's, that's good. Look forward to that. If you've got any ideas, raise rants at protonmail.com. Right, let's get started. I was talking to a friend the other day and he said, do you remember the old cars in the winter when you had to use the choke? We don't have the choke anymore. Do you remember the choke? There was a knob on the dashboard. You pull it out uh, when you're first starting the, the car, winter or summer. When you first started in the morning, you had to pull the choke out and then you had to push the choke back in as the engine warmed up. And sometimes people would forget to push it back in and the engine would start coughing and spluttering. But we were talking about cars back in the 50s in particular and the 60s in the winter. Now, my neighbour, he was lucky enough to have a garage when I was, what, I was 10, I suppose. And he'd park his car in his garage at night and underneath the engine, under the sump at the bottom of the engine, he had a paraffin lamp. It was a paraffin heater. That was to keep the engine warm so it didn't freeze. Now, I don't know whether they didn't have antifreeze in those days or whether he just didn't bother with it or perhaps the antifreeze wasn't very good back then. But he had to keep the engine warm. And this paraffin lamp, I used to watch him in the evening park his car in the garage. I used to go and have a look because we had a shared drive so I could just wander and have a look at him. Then he'd get his matches out Light this little paraffin thing. It looked like a Davy lamp. You know, the ones they used to take down the the coal mines. And he'd he'd get down and lean under the car and shove this lamp under the engine. I don't know that it did any good because surely there were drafts in the garage would blow the heat away. A lot of people back then, I remember, they'd have a a cracked engine block because the, the water in the engine had frozen. And of course, ice expands and it would crack the engine block open. There are all sorts of things like that about the old cars. These days, it doesn't matter whether it's a a heat wave or minus 20. You hop in your car, start it up and off you go. You don't think about frozen engine or the choke, anything like that. It just doesn't even come to mind. Also back then, particularly in the 50s, a lot of cars didn't have a heater. It was an optional extra. In my Hillman Minx, my 1954 Hillman Minx, my first car, there was no heater in that. So what I did, I couldn't get the original optional extra to fit into it. So I went and found some old heater up the dump, took it off of another car, Vauxhall, Ford, whatever it was. And I, I stuffed it up under the dashboard, connected the water pipes to it from the engine, connected the 12 volt uh, for the fan and a switch on the dashboard. And it worked really well. And it was wonderful having a heater. If ever I gave anyone a lift, they commented, oh, you've got a heater in your car. So going back to the old times, and another thing people would comment on, oh, you've got a radio in your car. Cars didn't come with a radio. That was another optional extra. So going back to cars in particular, to the old days, the difference between then and now, of course, another difference is that you could repair your car in those days. If you were a little bit mechanically minded, you could clean the spark plugs clean the points, check the points, change the points and muck about with the engine, check the oil. These days you can't do anything. You lift the bonnet, it's full of plastic boxes, you can't do anything. 
Now this is something you won't believe. <laughs> Back then, if you were lucky enough to have an optional extra heater, how did you turn the heater on and off? There was the fan on the dashboard, that's just a 12 volt fan in the, in the heater unit, but how did you turn the heater actually on or off? What you would do is lift the bonnet, or the hood in America, you'd lift that up, and there's a tap. There's a water tap on the side of the engine, and you'd have to screw that in, like the old gate valves on immersion heaters. You'd screw that in, that was off, you'd unscrew it to turn the heater on. I mean, that's incredible, isn't it? With the cars these days, it's just a, a button on the dashboard. You'd have an oil pressure gauge, a temperature gauge. You had to keep your eye on the oil pressure on the engine, because if that started falling, there was something wrong. And now you won't believe this one either, well, unless you're old. <laughs> Happy days. If you parked out in the road at night, you had to have a parking lamp. There were two ways of doing this. You either had a, a switch on your dashboard, which would put the side lights on one side or the other. So the front and back lights, normally they're all four are on, aren't they? So you'd have a switch for parking. So either the offside lights would be on back and front or the near side lights back and front. Now that was a bit of a drain on the battery. So someone came out with this idea, a little lamp that you'd fix on the, the roof guttering OK, wire in through the window to wherever you plug it in. I think they had cigarette, yes, they had cigarette lighters back in those days. And this little lamp, there was a tiny bulb in it. The back half of the lamp was red and the front half was just clear plastic. So it was sort of white. And that was a parking lamp. Can you imagine that? It didn't flatten the battery too much because it was only a small bulb in there. But at night, pitch dark, it was just enough for other drivers, cyclists, to see that there was a car parked there. Imagine having to fix, you know, you park your car outside somewhere at night and you've got to fix this parking lamp onto the, the roof uh, section. <laughs> it's quite funny looking back. When I went to California in 1975, it was summer and the chap uh, we were staying with, he said, I'm just going to turn the air con on, it's getting hot. So he stopped there, pulled in, I, I got out. He lifted the bonnet, the hood, he lifted that up. And I thought, what's he doing? Turn the air con on. I got out of the car and had a look. There's a lever. There's a, a, a V-belt and a compressor, like an old fridge compressor, with this big drive belt. And he moved a lever, which tightened the drive belt, and he locked the lever in position. So the engine was then turning the compressor for the air con. Again, these days, you press a little button on the dashboard. As I said, how things have changed. Of course, cars had cigarette lighters back then, didn't they? They were called cigar lighters because most cars on the dashboard had a pull-out ashtray. And I remember people stopping by the curb and emptying the ashtray out in the, in the gutter in the road. Dreadful. Interesting email from Cody. Hello, Cody. Nice to hear from you. You mention genetic memory. Do I believe in such a thing? To be honest, I've never heard of it. I've since looked it up. And basically it is memories inherited like you might inherit, I don't know, baldness or, <laughs> or or whatever physically. But are there memories that can be inherited from ancestors? That's interesting. Cody says that he's been looking into DNA and things and he is 90%, he's in America, by the way, is 90% uh, sort of British blood. So he reckons that might explain why he loves sitting in a in a pub in a dark sort of corner of a pub, just like we do here in Britain, you know, in the winter, there's a log fire going, a typical British pub. And he says he loves that so much. Could that be genetic memory? That's a good question, Cody. I must read up on that. I like that sort of thing. It's interesting. He also asked me, what is my favourite beer when I go to a pub? I think IPA, which is India Pale Ale. Now, a lot of different breweries make IPA and most of them are pretty good. Hobgoblin IPA from a supermarket comes in cans. It's only 3.6%, which I like. I don't like beers that are 5% and over. It's just too much. I don't want to fall over on the second glass of beer. <laughs> Whereas the Hobgoblin IPA is rather nice in the cans from the supermarket, and it's not that expensive. In the pub, I don't know, there's various IPA beers 
they're all pretty good. There's Doom Bar. I used to like that, but I, I sort of went off that. That's straight out of the, what is it, the barrel, the cask or whatever, on a, a proper hand pump, you know, the beer engine. I used to enjoy that, but I kind of went off that. John Smith's is another bitter. I like that, but it's very creamy. It really is creamy. I think that's the way to dis describe it. It's a lovely drink, but it's, I don't know, it's not quite for me. I know people say that the real ale beers in uh, in bottles, the real ale beers, a lot of them are fizzy. And they say, well, it's, that's not real ale. The thing is about a real ale, from what I understand, it has to come from a barrel where it's still fermenting. Is that Have I got that right? Are there any pub landlords or landladies listening or serious is it what's the thing camera isn't it the real l people any camera members listening that could enlighten me so when you get so-called real ale in a bottle it's not real ale at all i don't know what it is it's just ale but there are a lot of bottled ales which are very nice lager as i said to cody lager is disgusting i will only drink lager if there's a kind of session like a barbecue summer afternoon early evening where I'm going to be at the barbecue for several hours well I don't want just two glasses of IPA or real ale I want something weak like some of the lagers are very weak and I can just have several pints of it and it doesn't do any damage apart from visiting the the loo every every five minutes but interesting stuff, though, Cody, especially about this genetic memory thing. That That is interesting. Anyone got any comments on that? Raise rants at protonmail.com. Oh, by the way, I've tried Guinness on two or three occasions and I don't like it. I don't know what it is. I know it's very, very popular, especially in Ireland, but it just it doesn't suit me. I don't know why. We don't go to pubs. I've said this many times before. They're too expensive, unfortunately. Pubs used to be fantastic places, community sort of centres. Everyone gathers. You meet your friends there, uh, family, relations, all sorts. Fantastic. Make new friends. But it's all gone. Unfortunately, a lot of the pubs in Britain now are restaurants. So gone are the group of regulars standing up at the bar, having a good old natter and putting the world to rights. There's no one standing at the bar, only perhaps people getting a drink before they sit down to order their meal. It's it's a shame a lot of them have gone. There are still one or two around, but they are, as I as I used to say, far and few between. And Tricia always correct, corrected me there. It's not far and few between, it's few and far between, isn't it? Happy days. <laughs> Bob, hello to you. Uh, yes, how remiss of me. Bob has reminded me that, as he puts it, I have many listeners across the pond in America and elsewhere in the world. And I do tend to forget that when I'm banging on about some British thing. I do tend to forget that people outside Britain might not have a clue what I'm talking about. Bob mentions conkers. What are, what did he say, Bob? What the heck are conkers? I'll tell you what conkers are. You know oak trees? Well, of course you do. They drop acorns, don't they? As they're sort of seeds or nuts for more oak trees to grow. Conkers are the sort of equivalent of the horse chestnut tree. They are three or four times bigger, I suppose, than acorns. You get some quite large conkers. And the idea of the game is, what you do is you get a conker, drill or skewer a hole through the centre of it, put a bit of string through, tie a knot underneath so it can't come off the end and you can swing it round on the bit of string. So you hold it still, so it's hanging down right in front of you, a couple of feet in front of you and then your opponent with his conker, he has to whack yours. It sounds daft, doesn't it? He whacks your conker. Then it's your turn. He holds his still, it's hanging there and you whack his. And the one that wins is the one that is left with the conker intact because they shatter eventually, they just fall to pieces and shatter. Now in the process of whacking each other's conkers, uh, fingers, knuckles, hands, everything gets battered and bruised. I've got an idea, Bob, I'm going to look this up in a minute. I've already had a quick look. The game of conkers, I think, started, was it in, in New York? I'll come back to that a little bit later in the episode. Quite interesting. Conkers. Yes, they are the 
nuts that fall from the horse chestnut tree. Do you have horse chestnut trees in America? I shall have to ask my son in North Carolina. He'll say, now, here's the thing. <laughs> so that's it, Bob. That's what conkers are. And basically, you sort of hit each other's conker until it smashes. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? <laughs> or not. Ray, hello to you. Ray sent me some photos and a couple of videos that he took of a UFO, an unidentified flying object. And it's quite interesting. It's only a small dot, but it reminded me, thanks for that, Ray, reminded me of my days many moons ago when I used to go up the Downs with a couple of friends and we'd have a tent and we'd take a few beers and we'd be up there all night looking at the night sky, looking out for UFOs. We saw satellites going across, shooting stars, or so-called shooting stars, but I don't think we ever, well, I know we didn't. We didn't see <laughs> any UFOs, no aliens, no flying saucers came to say hello while we were up there. Great fun, though, hunting for them. Do I believe, now this isn't Ray's question, I'm just thinking out loud. Do I believe in life out there on other planets? The law of averages states, whatever, I don't know what the law of averages is, but it states that out of the billions of planets, how can just one have life on it, the Earth? There must be others. But does the law of averages apply to that sort of thing? I've no idea. What are your thoughts on that? Is there life on Mars? That was David Bowie, wasn't it? <laughs> Email me your thoughts on that. Life out there, I wonder. And if there is, is it more intelligent than us? Well, I think anyone's more intelligent than us. We keep blowing each other up. So, or is it less intelligent than us? Do they keep blowing each other up? Perhaps we will never know. I found an article on Conker's first mention of the game, Robert Southerly's memoirs published in 1821. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, a similar game was played with hazelnuts or snail shells. Snail shells? Well, they'd break, wouldn't they? It was only from the 1850s that using horse chestnuts was regularly referred to in certain regions. Right, it's not quite sure where the game came from. The word conquer, dialect meaning knockout, so that sort of makes sense, doesn't it? The first recorded game of conquers, using horse chestnuts, was on the Isle of Wight. In 1848, how about that? The Isle of Wight in 1848. Conkers was played during the late 40s and early 50s in New York, in the Flatbush section of Brooklyn. Well, there you go. So I was right about that. It was also played in Queens, the upper west side of Manhattan, in the Mohawk Valley area of upstate New York, Westmount, Quebec, and other English-speaking part, Montreal. That's interesting. There's a load more about it, but uh, if you want, you can have a look on on uh, the internet yourself. But that is interesting. Who would have thought that when I used to play conkers at school in the playground, that there was so much history behind the game? Now, talking of school, why weren't we taught that in history? That would have been interesting to us lads. The teacher talking about conkers and where the game originated and where it started. Instead of banging on about Harold getting an arrow in his eye in 1066 at Hastings. I mean, that was interesting as well, I suppose, to some people. But I'd rather have heard about conkers. <laughs> talking of real ale, as we were, I have often wondered what it would be like to go back, say, 200 years into an old pub where there's, they've got all the real ales or and all this stuff. What would it be like to taste a, a pint of their ale back in those days? It was probably all right for them, but I would probably find it disgusting. I don't know what the alcohol, the percentage alcohol would be, probably about 20%. Did they have uh, the method of measuring specific gravity and all that sort of thing? Probably not. They just brewed it up and thought, that tastes good. <laughs> Have a few pints of that and fall over. I don't know, but they had barrels, didn't they? When was 200 years ago? Yeah, kind of 18. When was beer invented? Now, they talk about wine in the Bible. I wonder when beer came into being. Something else to look up. My book of things to look up is so full now, I daren't add any more. Anyway, does anyone know where, where, when beer originated? Where did it come from? Who decided to grow hops 
or who found some hops somewhere. It's like wine, isn't it? I suppose someone picked some grapes, left them somewhere and forgot about them, so they fermented. And they decided perhaps to eat them and, and got drunk <laughs> and thought, this is good. So they stomped on them with their feet, drained off the liquid <laughs> and sold it. Probably how it started, isn't it? Many moons ago. That's twice I've said many moons, but I'm trying not to say fantastic too often. While on the theme of alcohol, boozing and all that stuff, <laughs> I remember I was, what, eight years old? I had dreadful toothache. And my dad said that he poured me a glass of whiskey. And he said, don't swallow it, but just rinse it all round. You take a mouthful, wash it all round your, your tooth. And it worked. It, it did help the toothache a lot. But it tasted foul. And I think that is why from, I mean, this isn't genetic memory, is it? It's a physical memory of when I was eight years old. But I think that is why just the smell of whiskey really makes me feel ill. I just can't stand even the smell of it. I have tried tasting it. I just don't like it. It doesn't suit me at all. And I wonder whether that's going back to when I was eight years old with a toothache. My nan, bless her, my old nan, <laughs> when I was about the same age, maybe I was 10, she poured me a glass of port and lemon. She was having a glass and I said, what's that, Nan? She said, it's port and lemon. Do you want to try some? So she poured me a glass of port and lemon, which is basically port, which is fortified wine, isn't it? And some lemonade. And I liked it. I, th I thought it was like Ribena. Ribena is like a, it's a blackcurrant drink, if you've not heard of that one. And she said, don't tell your mum. Anyway, I did tell my mum. I told her a couple of years ago about it. And she said, oh, she shouldn't have done that. <laughs> So, yeah, I waited kind of what, 60 years or more before I told my mum what, what, what her mum had done. And I still like port and lemon today. I don't like any spirits, gin, vodka. I don't like any of that lot. Rum, <laughs> that's horrible. <laughs> I don't really like any alcohol. Well, yes, that's a lie, isn't it? I like real ale, so I, ca I cannot tell a lie. When I said going to a pub 200 years ago, surely 500 years ago they had pubs, didn't they? And they were brewing beer, probably something like 2000 BC, they discovered wine. But uh, yes, it would be interesting to find out when beer was first discovered or invented or whatever they did with it. Many people have said that if they discovered alcohol today, it would be classed as a, a class A drug and be banned. <laughs> it would, though, wouldn't it? When you think of you know, the damage that alcohol can do, car accidents and deaths and things it probably would be banned. Then I'd have to stick to Ribena. I knew a girl called Rabina once, and I used to call her Ribena. <laughs> I just came to mind. Rabina, her name was. I called her Ribena. It sounded a lot better. I forget where she came from. I mean, she was, uh, you know, she was British, but her kind of ancestry where, I don't know, what do they call it? The line of something rather, where she originated from or her family did. I can't remember. All I do remember about her is she was weird, <laughs> totally weird. But we won't go into that. I shall save that for another episode. Well, the months are moving on. We're coming up to November. Halloween on Tuesday the 31st, next Tuesday. So that's not far off. The clocks changed. Now, you're listening to this on Sunday. The clocks here went back, didn't they? Fall, spring forward, fall back. So the clocks are now back an hour from what they were. So you're expecting this on Sunday morning at eight o'clock. I don't know whether you have, I know you do in America. Do you change the clocks in Australia? I think I've asked this before and I have had answers, but I forget, you know what my memory is like. At two o'clock, no, Sunday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning, two o'clock. And it is true that some people wait up until two in the morning to put the clocks back an hour. When I first heard that, I didn't believe it, but I do know of people that do that. They wait up. You don't have to do that. Just put the clock an hour before you go to bed. Doesn't matter what time it is. Oh, that reminds me. A few months or weeks ago, I was talking about, weeks ago it was, people commenting and taking an interest in what other people do when they should mind their own business. This is, I forget now, Derwent, I think your name was. You mentioned, <laughs> I forgot to put this email on, I keep meaning to mention it and I keep forgetting. You said that a uh, friend of yours, he watches you all the time and comments on what you're wearing and what you're doing and 
what you should be doing or what you should not be doing. And he contacted me again. And he said, a friend of his came round and said, what's that smell? Are you cooking dinner? And you know, this, uh, his wife said, yeah, we're cooking dinner. And this was four o'clock in the afternoon. And he said, this friend of his said, four o'clock, dinner at four o'clock in the afternoon. He said, well, half four by the time it's ready. <laughs> and he said, it's so strange. People worrying about what time you're cooking dinner. Some people have their main meal at lunchtime, don't they? Midday, one o'clock. Some people, quite a few people I know, have their main meal at one o'clock in the afternoon. Nothing wrong with that. We have ours half four, five o'clock-ish. The reason we like to have our main meal early is because you shouldn't go to bed on a full stomach. When I was 18, yes, I'd go to the pub, have six pints of beer, go to the local curry place, Indian curry, have a load of that and more beer, and then go to bed at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Absolutely full of beer and curry and sleep perfectly well through the night. But these days at my age, I can't eat late into the evening. So we do the same, Derwent. We do exactly the same. We have hours at sort of half four, five o'clock. So by the time we go to bed and go to sleep, a lot of it has been digested. So it does make sense, Derwent. Eating late into the night when you're older just causes problems. Talking of Indian restaurants, went into one a few years ago, Trish, myself, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, the four of us, and they had Spitfire in... Uh, bottles the real ale type spitfire drink which is very nice and in the <laughs> up at the supermarket that day i had just bought some to stock up and they were a pound each in the restaurant place four pounds each and i thought crikey stone the crows adding three quid they probably went up the supermarket and bought them from there pound each and added three quid on profit that's a lot isn't it this is the trouble this is why a lot of people I've heard have said, oh, no, we don't go out. We don't eat out anymore. It's all too expensive. We don't go to pubs. We don't go to pubs. We can't afford the prices. I know they've got to pay staff and they've got to pay their, their rent and their insurance and electricity and the heating bill and all that. But to pay a pound for a, a beer and sell it for four. Well, look at the bottles of wine. Now, up at our club, as I've said before, you get a bottle of wine and it's, what is it, eight quid or something, which is pretty good. You go to a pub and ask for a bottle of wine, it'd probably cost you 20 quid or more. And a restaurant, 30. Who wants to pay 30 quid for a bottle of wine? Well, I certainly don't. I don't like wine. <laughs> Just had an email from the Met Office, another one, warning of rain causing disruption, flooding and goodness knows what. They've had it so bad up north, northern England, Scotland, really bad up there. We're lucky at the moment, sunshine, blue sky, temperatures, what, about 23 under our patio roof, rather nice. The tortoise has been out, old Gary, he's been plodding around the lawn, munching on weeds and things, so he's quite happy, getting closer to hibernation, but if the weather keeps up like this, it'll be some time yet before he closes his eyes and disappears for a few months. I almost forgot, Cody, your email, I was just going through emails again, I forgot the PS at the bottom of your email. Your podcast is the best, you are charismatic, have a great voice for radio, and this is 100% real email. <laughs> How about that? Thank you, Cody. All my emails are 100% genuine. Well, almost all of them, anyway. <laughs> Happy days. Oh, I nearly forgot, I've got to just let you hear this. I stepped out onto the patio the other day. It was lashing with rain. So I stepped out onto the patio just to see what was happening. It sounded that bad. And this, this is the result. The wonderful British weather. Here we are. Brilliant sunshine. Wonderful sunshine. Really bright. Lashing with rain. Now, I don't know whether you can hear me over the rain. I can't see a rainbow. Hang on. No can't see a rainbow. We've got blue sky there, lovely sunshine. While I was out there looking for a rainbow, the, the rain did ease off slightly. It's calmed down a little bit now. <laughs> That's better. There's a pigeon coming up to see me. He's soaking wet. Oh, it has calmed down there. But beautiful sunshine. I can't see a rainbow anywhere. That's it. Hello, pigeon. He's come up here. He thinks I've got some food for him. Pigeon pie. 
is not taking any notice. 19 degrees out here, sunshine and rain. Wonderful. Several of you have said that I should make more use of my little portable recorder. The quality is not too bad. You're right, I should make more use of it. There are various places I go to. If I had it in my pocket, I could record some interesting little clips, little delightful clips. <laughs> I don't know what of. Just various things going on. Perhaps uh, me driving along in the car, swearing about other motorists. No, I don't, I don't think that would be a good idea at all. Stow the crows. No, that wouldn't be good at all. But possibly, I don't know, just have the thing in my pocket. We're going to our club. Is it, uh, I can't remember, is it tomorrow or the next day? One of these music quiz things. I would take it there and record a bit of conversation from our little group. But the trouble is the blasted man that does the quiz... He's mad. He blasts music out. People everywhere in the club, they're trying to have a chat before the quiz starts and he keeps putting on this music and it's so loud, people have to shout. And I can't stand shouting and loud noises. So the whole thing, I don't know, it's a disaster. No point taking the recorder at all. Just want to tell you about some TV programmes we've been trying to look through. Just before I say that, went down for lunch just now with Trish and mother-in-law. The squirrel sitting on the patio table, looking through the window at us, looking there with his little hands clasped, as if to say, well, where's my lunch? Now, the trouble is, I put some nuts on the patio the other day for him. Well, for them, there are several of them. And I knew what would happen. I shouldn't have done it. Every day now, he sits on the table, and his mates as well, they're milling around, looking through the windows. They move their heads about, like, well, where are they? Where's those human people with the nuts? So we've been having to feed them. Anyway, TV programmes. Now, listen to this. I'm going to moan. Now, you know I never moan, never complain. We've been trying to find something new to watch. We have watched Vera, you know, Vera, the detective lady. A hundred times, every episode, we've watched again and again. Midsummer Murders. We've watched every episode. Hundreds, I know the script off by heart. Sherlock Holmes. Poirot, you know, Poirot, we've watched that Death on the Nile and all this. Miss Marple, we've watched every Miss Marple there is a hundred times. And Trish was saying, what are we going to watch tonight? And I said, oh, well, have we got a, a Vera or something? She said, well, not again. We can't have Vera again. So Sherlock Holmes, brilliant, the old black and white ones from the 40s, was it? Yeah, I believe the 40s. Basil Rathbone, Nigel Bruce as Watson. Fantastic, but we've seen all those so many times. So Trish said, right, we've got Netflix and some other flicks and whatever else we've got. All this weird stuff I don't really understand. But anyway, she went through that. I forget what it was, but she said, oh, look, let's have a go at this. And she put it on and I, I didn't say anything, but I thought, good grief, this is rubbish. Some modern rubbish. And after about 10 minutes, she said, are you into this? Uh, no, I said, no, not really. Thank goodness for that, she said. It's absolute rubbish and turned it off. Then she found something else. I, f I don't know what it was called. That was rubbish. Now, we saw a programme the other day about the TV in the 60s and 70s. Z Cars, Dixon of Dot Green, all this decent stuff that people loved. Even a bit, was it a bit later than that? The Sweeney, things like that. The Professionals. The Avengers, Diana Rigg and uh, Mrs Peel and Steed. Where's all those programmes gone? Where are they all now? They've all gone, but where are the replacements? Surely the rubbish they put on now, that isn't the modern equivalent, is it? Surely. If it is, it's a waste of space. We've watched the later Holmes, Jeremy Brett. He was brilliant, I liked him. But Basil Rathbone, was he was the first, I th was he the first one? He was excellent, absolutely excellent. All Creatures Great and Small, the original version. We've watched that again and again and again. That's going back to the 70s. Yeah, 70s. The Saint, Simon Templer, The Saint. Do you remember that? That was good. Randall and Hopkirk. All these programmes were brilliant. And I don't know, is it just me? Because I'm now older and I'm looking back to that and thinking, well, that was brilliant and the stuff now is rubbish. Or am I right? And the stuff now is rubbish. Raise rants at protonmail.com. Who agrees with me that it's all rubbish? 
and the, the comedians back then. Was it Freddie Starr? I can't remember all the names. Freddie Starr, Tommy Cooper. There were loads. Les Dawson and the other chap, I forget his name. That shows my age. Where he says, uh, what is it? You are awful, but I like you. I can't remember his name. That's gone. Hopeless. The comedians now, on Richard's House of Games that we watch, they have comedians. And that Richard says, right, here we've got four famous faces. What? Famous? Never heard of them. Never seen them. Who are they? And they're all stand-up comedians. Never heard of them. Have you heard of them? Do you know them? I don't know any of these comedians. Who was that chap that said, well, you are awful, but I like you? Dick Emery, of course. Dick Emery. I am showing my age. I'm getting so forgetful. Dick Emery, that was it. And what about, as I mentioned a little while ago, didn't I, a couple of weeks back, Fireball XL5, Thunderbirds. Thunderbirds are go. Brilliant stuff. There's nothing to replace that now, apart from rubbish. Mike Yarwood. There were so many. I don't know. I don't know what's happened to television. Sunday night at the London Palladium. I didn't like that when I was younger, because it wasn't my sort of thing. But uh, Bruce Forsyth on there, wasn't there? And Bob, was it Bob Hope? And then look at the old carry-on films. I know it's all old hat now, but the carry-on films, they're still showing them now on some of these weird channels. And they're brilliant, but... Again, we've seen them all a hundred times. That, that's the trouble. Everything has been repeated so often. Stingray, do you remember Stingray? The Champions, do you remember that? Was it the three people that did mind reading and stuff? The A-Team, that was good. I like the A-Team. It's all silly. You know, when you look at it, it's all silly stuff, but it was great. The Dukes of Hazard, Boss Hog. And what was that chap? Something, Coal Train, I forget. <laughs> I forget that. It was all daft in that car they used to race around in. And they're always on the CB radio, weren't they? But it was it was great. It was great stuff. It was good entertainment, which is what television should be. On that programme we watched about TV in the old days, they showed some clips from Coronation Street back in the 60s. I think they said it started in 62. That's early, isn't it? And they showed Len Fairclough, Elsie Tanner, Ina Sharples, Dennis Tanner, all the, the black and white, and all the people from them. It was fantastic to watch it. I mean, I've never watched Coronation Street. I don't like these soaps. I did like Dallas. Everyone must remember Dallas. J.R. Ewing and Sue Ellen. <laughs> Again, it was daft, was it? Ray Krabs and that, not Poison Ivy. What was it? What was that? Poison Woman or something. That funny little woman. It was daft, but I remember watching that. That was good fun. I can't quite sum up what it is about today's programmes, today's films, that is wrong for me. I think there's too much music. All the time there's music going, and it's weird music. It's not, I don't know what it is. You get drums going, da -da 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 for the whole time. And you're thinking, oh, shut up, I'm trying to hear what the woman's saying, you know, and you've got these drums going. I don't know. I, I think, as I said, I'm probably just too old. I just remember the old stuff, how good it was at the time. But uh, I expect the youngsters out there wouldn't agree. Who was it in North Wales? Emily. Emily, you're in your 20s. You emailed me last week, didn't you? What do you think about these modern TV programmes? And I suppose you think the old ones are rubbish, don't you? If you've ever looked at any, that is. Yeah, if you're listening, Emily, let me know what you think. Someone in their 20s or anyone younger, teens even, what do you think of this modern rubbish? You'll probably say, oh, it's not modern rubbish, it's great. Do you remember Doctor Who? Who remembers Doctor Who, the first episode, when it came out? That was the 60s. That was brilliant back then. Then they introduced the Daleks. That was fantastic. That was good TV back then. There were some good game shows back then. Do you remember Huey Green with Double Your Money? Was he the one that said, I mean that most sincerely, folks? Was that his kind of catch line? Huey Green, double your money. Then Michael Miles, what was his show? Take your pick. That's right, didn't you have to open a box? Open box 13 or something. I wasn't heavily into the the games like that, but they were good. They were well done. And what was that one where you have to answer? Was that on the London Palladium on a Sunday night? A chap stood there with a gong. He would ask the contestant questions and you're not allowed to say yes or no. For example, did you like the summer? It was very nice. Are you looking forward to the winter? I don't like the winter. Do you have a car? Yes. 
Dong, that's it, he'd failed the test. <laughs> that was quite interesting to watch. I won't keep on about this, but Benny Hill, till death us do part, George and Mildred. What was that? Oh, Steptoe, Steptoe and Son. I like Steptoe and Son, with their horse and cart. Rag and bone men, weren't they? Rising damp, only fools and horses. I, I sort of watched that. It wasn't really my thing. Birds of a feather, 40 towers, of course. That was fantastic. The young ones, can't remember any more. There must be lo oh, what was that other love thy neighbour. That's it. That was a program, was it? That was good. Just so many programs to choose from back then, mind you. I say so many to choose from back then. We only had three channels in the sixties. No, in the fifties we had one channel. Then we had two. In the sixties we had three. Then Channel Four came along, so we had four channels. But the content, the choice of programs, was far better than it is today with hundreds of channels. I wasn't into the goodies much. I thought that was a bit silly, but again, thousands of people, millions, loved the goodies. I used to like some of the old kids' programmes. Andy Pandy, that was quite good. And the Wooden Tops, Bill and Ben. <laughs> One of the modern, well, perhaps it's not quite so modern now, kids' programmes that I did like was The Night Garden. Was that, uh, that was recently, wasn't it? A few years ago, The Night Garden. It looked like they were all on drugs. They are all stoned. <laughs> that was quite funny, the night garden. I don't know who dreamt that up. Someone that was uh, obviously high on something wrote the script. Well, there wasn't really a script. They're just mumbling about these people. And they'd fly through the woods. You've probably seen it. If not, have a look at the night garden. When I was young, I liked Peyton Place. What I used to get confused about, I remember, I don't know how old I was, about 11 or 12. They had... American programmes on our telly and they'd say uh, I'm going to contact the DA's office now the DA obviously is the district attorney I thought it was district attorney as in E and I thought it should be DE not DA district attorney it's not attorney <laughs> and I, no one corrected me I did ask people they didn't know what I was talking about so the DA's office is the district attorney couldn't understand why. Oh, well, what about Rawhide? Rawhide, remember that? Bonanza was great. That was on every Sunday afternoon with the, the map burning. Hoss, Ben Cartwright. Fantastic stuff. That's all gone. What is there now to replace that? Right, I've banged on enough about that. You're probably all getting bored now. You're probably saying, oh, for goodness sake, shut up. Talk about something else. I will do, as from now. No more telly. Just one more telly. Mike Yarwood. Brilliant. Right, that's it. No more telly. How about radio? Let me bore you to bits with radio. Proper radio st pirate stations. Not this BBC rubbish. No, that's it. No more now. Let's move on. Now, we've got Halloween coming up any day now, haven't we? Uh, when is that? Is that Tuesday 31st? I'm supposed to be working on a ghost story. Do you know I do these ghost stories on YouTube videos? If you want to look for it, what's it called? Ray's ghost and pirate radio stories or something anyway mark hello mark over there in dublin he has sent me a halloween story so i shall let you have a listen to mark while i go and make myself another cup of coffee hello ray old boy you worthing original you it's mark here <laughs> i've got a halloween story for you and why shouldn't i because after all hasn't halloween got its origins right here in the emerald isle i'm gonna move swiftly along because this is your show not mine this story and mightily bored you'll be concerns my late mother emily who came from a place called the curra in County Kildare, and it was a great place for her growing up as a child because, you see, it was during the war and fighters and bombers were crashing everywhere and their crews were interned in the Curra camp in Ireland. And indeed, one Luftwaffe crew, as they were being led away to be incarcerated, gifted my mother their dog. Yes, they had an absolute lassie look-alike with them up in the bomber. And that dog survived after the war for many a year on a local farm. Anyway, in 1930s and 40s Ireland, bovine tuberculosis, or TB as it was known, was rampant. And my mother contracted that awful disease. So she was wrenched away from her family to go up to County Dublin and a place called Piemont Sanatorium. If you Google it, 
you'll find old sepia photos, black and whites, of the patients' beds out in the sanatorium grounds because it was reckoned that the fresh air was good for them. And she was witness at a party to some awful things that a child should never experience. For instance, laying out the dead and closing their eyes. Poverty was in the mix, but it didn't really make any difference because everybody else was poor. And she got to know a girl who'd come from right across the country from the west of Ireland in County Galway. She was called Nancy, and Nancy and Emily became good friends. One day, my mother said to Nancy, Are you doing okay? Are you all right? And Nancy replied, Oh, Emily, it won't be long now till the old banshee is coming for me. Straight away, I can imagine your listeners rolling their eyes as they conjure up images of the old crone with the long hair and the comb. But keep in mind, my mother didn't have a clue what a banshee even was back then. They shared a dormitory room and a couple of nights later, my mother was awoken at about three o'clock in the morning with a terrible howling and awful commotion. Right across from her in Nancy's bed, what she described as a disembodied noise hung over the bed. It was a fierce, blood-curdling, howling and crying or keening as it's known. She recalled it was like a, a mix of a human in pain and an animalistic, a wild beast. Indeed, she said it was like the noise a cat makes. You know, that caterwauling when a cat is afraid but is prepared to fight. <coughs> this cacophony hung over the bed for about five, ten minutes or so. It was awful eventually ending in an ear-piercing crescendo. And then, as my mother said, the sobbing seemed to ebb slowly away. Now, you know, this may seem evil, but it's not. It's a phenomenon that seems to follow old Irish families across the generations, and even in a couple of cases across the sea to America. It's actually there to heal and console. It's purgative in nature. By the way, Nancy hadn't moved at all during this entire commotion. And no doubt you can guess, the next morning Nancy was dead. And you know, Ray, the family was so poor that Nancy's father arrived in a crock of a car, literally put Nancy into the coffin and lashed it to the top of the car and had to drive all the way back to Galway with her because they couldn't afford a hearse or an ambulance. As a boy, I remember my mother telling me that. And years later, I addressed it with her again. And she stuck to her guns. She never was given to exaggeration. And there you have it, the banshee. Oh, I've worn out me welcome. Happy Halloween for me, Mark, in Ireland, to you and the lovely Trish, and indeed your fantastic listeners. Thanks, Mark. Great stuff. I do appreciate the MP3s. Anyone else want to send me any recordings? I know I'm always banging on about this. I have had a few in the past, which has been good. But if you want to send me a, an MP3 or any recording in any format, I can sort it out. Raise rants at protonmail.com. Just going back to meal time when you have your main meal of course at school school dinners that was the main meal at midday midday one o'clock ish that was the main meal i can't remember do we have another meal in the evening i think we did we had sort of two dinners the main one at school then the main one at home so as i said earlier it doesn't matter what time of day you have your meal as you get older just don't eat too late in the evening because you'll have a dreadful night (laughs) this genetic memory thing has been playing on my mind you know how you'll see a two or a three-year-old child at a grand piano playing like a concert pianist you look on youtube look up kids piano playing and all that a lot of them are chinese japanese a lot of them are, are very young three two three four years old and they are playing a grand piano like a concert a professional concert pianist now is that genetic uh, memory is that what is happening there I've often wondered how these children can do that me with my radio stuff yes I went to technical college doing the radio and tv servicing bit of a waste of time I learnt more in the workshop but now here's the thing (laughs) here's the thing I'm working on a, a 1960s aircraft transmitter that I've been given at the moment and I've got no information on it, no schematics, no circuit diagram. But by poking around it, I I seem to have some knowledge. I'm not explaining this very well, am I? I seem to know things that I've not been told or taught. I just know. It's like someone will pick up a, a musical instrument and they can just play it. With me, I can get hold of a radio and I seem to understand what's going on just by poking around, looking at it. Is that some sort of genetic memory? I don't know. Then, of course, you can go back to past lives. Was I Marconi? 
<laughs> was I Marconi in a past life, playing about with transmitting across the Atlantic and stuff like that? No, I doubt it. No, let's not go into past lives because that's a different subject altogether. But the genetic memory thing, I don't know whether any of my ancestors were into electronics or, or anything like that. As far as I know, they weren't. But it is amazing how some people, they just master something seemingly without any thought. Brian Jones, apparently, of the Rolling Stones, who sadly passed away when he was young, apparently he could master, they reckon, any instrument within about 30 minutes. Give him any instrument and he'd think, right, well, how do you do this? Oh, yeah, yeah I've got it. And he'd play it within about 30 minutes. Give me an instrument, it, you know, 30 years, I still can't do it. It's interesting anyway, food for thought. Right, we're coming to the end now. It's uh, nearly an hour. Now, here's a little story from Rob that I thought you might like to listen to. After school, my friends and I often went to the local park before heading home. In the park, there were swings, a slippery dip or slide, monkey bars around about, which was on a circular swivel stand. I remember those, and you'd fly around on them. One of my friends, he says, was very strong for his age. He could pick up any of us, literally, in one hand. We all decided to have a go on the roundabout, and my strong friend offered to push. I remember that. I remember flying round on those things. They got banned in the end, I think. Within a few minutes, we were turning at about 80 miles an hour, or close to it, and we're hanging on. When anyone let go, they were thrown halfway across the park. Yes, memories, memories, I love it. The roundabout going at this speed was starting to rock and it was making growling sounds. Fortunately, it didn't come loose or come off its foundation. Although another time visiting the park, the roundabout had gone. Well, I'm not surprised. Had it been removed due to safety precautions or did someone actually push it so hard it took off into outer space? Perhaps it's still up there orbiting the earth. I don't know. In another park, my risk-taker school friend would enjoy himself by riding his push bike across the monkey bars and down the slippery dip. That's the slide, isn't it? The slippery dip. That's fantastic, Rob. Yes, I, I remember that. Do you remember the witch's hat? Which was a huge, well, witch's hat-shaped thing on a massive iron or steel pole. And the thing would bash from side to side. It would spin round and rock. Hugely dangerous. But that's when we were allowed to have fun, as with the Conkers. We were allowed to have fun back then. And yes, of course, we had bruised knuckles and scraped knees and lumps on our foreheads where we'd crashed our bike into a wall or something. It was good fun. But we're not allowed to have fun these days. At least you can have fun by listening to me ranting on every Sunday and every midweek message, of course. Don't forget to listen Wednesday. I shall see you then. Behave yourselves. <laughs> Here we go. Behave yourselves. Do what you like, do what I do and more and have some fun. Take care. Bye-bye for now.